Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Today, I have a returning guest, Dr. Roman Yampolsky, and he's a professor at the University of Louisville, and he's the director of cybersecurity laboratory in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Sciences at the Speed School of Engineering. He's recently been named to the 100 most influential people in AI for 2021. That's in the top 100. And and he's a fascinating individual because we we referred to his book recently. In 2019, he wrote a book called Artificial Intelligence, Safety, and Security. Now, why do I want you to, to listen to this? Well, one of the main things is I want you to understand as you're making decisions about using AI and using uh, algorithms that support AI of understanding what the differences are between artificial general intelligence for that we're expected to reach in the year 2045 and narrow AI, like very, very specific uh, narrow AI that you can take advantage of within your businesses today. Because ultimately, how do we control something that, that is going to be smarter than us? There are people thinking about this. There are people thinking about this from a human societal impact. Uh, they're thinking about it from a cultural impact, from a nation state perspective. And I think it's it's interesting to have this conversation to look at what's possible with AI and why this is going to be such a wide and, and sweeping technology uh, over the next uh, 10, 20, and 30 years. And most of us listening to this will still be alive at that point. So really being able to talk to people that are thinking about the future in this way, I think is gonna be very, very uh, useful. And we do talk about the differences between what it's gonna be like to actually take advantage of specific narrow applications of AI versus the wider impact that'll come when AI is actually truly more intelligent than us. So with that, I wanna introduce you to my great conversation with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. So Roman, I wanna welcome you to the show today. Thanks a lot. Great to be back. So let's talk about artificial intelligence. What, what, uh, well, let's talk about this first. You're a lecturer, you're a professor uh, at university, at the university environment, University of Louisville, correct? Yes. So what do you, what do you lecture about these days? What, what are, what are uh, the programs and uh, content that you're uh, presenting to your students just in a, in a general sense? Right. So my research and my teaching are not, uh, Exactly the same. I teach very kind of standard engineering AI course, uh, traditional, uh, we cover knowledge representation, search algorithms, whereas my research is more about futuristic systems, uh, machine learning. So there is some intersection at uh, AI ethics and uh, security aspects. But uh, yeah, what I teach and my uh, adventures and research are not the same. Sure, sure. Well, that, that makes sense. Well, you know, but, but maybe we can t- talk about the, we'll blend some of that conversation, but I, 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 a lot of the folks that are listening are business leaders. And, and so they're on the receiving end of the students that you're, you're putting out. And are, are you, you know, what, what do you, how do you define smart AI or, or weak AI versus intelligent AI? And would be a, it, it, maybe you can help us define that because I think that's a good one of the interesting starting points I'd like to explore with you. Sure, there is a lot of terms. Uh, weak AI and strong AI was a historical way of separating kind of uh, human level intelligence versus just narrow tools. So in the 60s, 70s, when we were creating expert systems for doing something very particular, that would be weak AI. And if we can ever get machine to do anything a human does, that's strong AI. Today, the terms probably would be narrow AI and artificial general intelligence, AGI. Of course, very quickly after you get to AGI, with all the advantages computers have, big memories, fast communication, you get super intelligence. You get beyond human performance and while keeping the same generality. So that's typically what people refer to when using those terms. Now, more confusing concepts come from things like consciousness, self-awareness. We usually stay away from that as to not confuse people too much, but uh, it's not a requirement. You can still do really good work optimization without your systems being conscious in any way. 
I was I was listening to thank you for that for the explanation because we, well, I want to explore some of the AGI, AGI um, uh, con, uh, future conversation a little bit later. I was listening to Jack Ma and Elon Musk in a conference last year, and and uh, you know it's almost like Elon had a disdain for uh, Jack Ma's responses to. And I know you, and you're smiling, so I think you probably saw the same the same interview. And you know, it's 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 either Jack truly just doesn't care uh, because of you know, and in, in, in culturally, China is just doing some things that 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 are way down. You know, they they can do things well before the U.S. is even allowed to even consider doing things. And then you've got Elon, who owns you know he's owns a brain computer interface company and. And, uh, and so he's, he does understand what's happening here. So what are your thoughts? Tell me what your thoughts are in that conversation. And generally, you know, are you more inclined to, uh, to Elon's side of the fence or Jack Ma's side of the fence? Uh, I would say Elon has a lot of good ideas. I usually don't criticize people who are more successful than me. Clearly <laughs> they know something I don't. Uh, in that conversation, it was interesting to see the, the difference of uh, futuristic outlook, I guess. Uh, only time will show who's right and uh, what, what's going to happen. But I obviously agree more with Elon. He has concerns about AI safety. He has uh, proposed some solutions in terms of having a backup planet, escaping to Mars, in terms of integrating with technology to become more competitive through yeah. Neuralink. So definitely, uh, I appreciate what he does. At the same time, he kind of helped... Uh, fund open AI, which probably expedited uh, AGI arrival by 10 years or so. So maybe there is some conflict of interest there. Yeah, I was just listening to the founder of open AI last or three weeks ago. And I think they just had a breakthrough recently with, um, with the AI's ability to identify uh, some visual, uh, visual images. Um, and the new technique, um, was it NG? What, what is the new, it was the, he explained um, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the, the technique, but... Um, There's something every day. Today we had a paper in Nature. I think we just defeated the uh, record from DeepMind in terms of how many Atari games they can out of play and how well they do. So something's happening every week. It's, it's a very quick developing field. So how do we... How do we uh, so AI is here and, and it is, from a disruption perspective, we might not see the full scope of... The disruption, but 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 definitely, we're. It's almost like there's a convergence happening. Um, not almost. There is a convergence happening where AI, uh, for example, the for, to run the run a drone and to run the drones that that Amazon wants to deliver your packages and and they want to deliver a cup of coffee within five or ten minutes to 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 someone if they order a cup of coffee. But to run that that drone, you need to have. Uh, AI, you need to have uh, uh, satellite links and, and geospatial. You got to be able to uh, fly uh, independently and, and have uh, backup of one of the rotors break. You have to have a lot of convergence of technologies happening. So where do you see AI uh, converging and what industries do you see that see it having the biggest impact? Well, I don't really see any industry which will avoid being impacted or completely changed by AI. It's just a question of... Uh you know, time. Some things are easier to automate than others. We see financial industry, especially with uh, blockchain and distributed finance being revolutionized in a matter of weeks, months. Uh, healthcare has a lot of potential for treating biology as just a subset of computer science. You have DNA, you can reprogram it, uh, maybe cure diseases, maybe give us a little more lifespan, maybe infinite lifespan. So a lot of potential, and uh, we don't even know how to price those things. What do you charge someone for immortality? What's the, you charge per month, you charge one-time fee. A lot of those things will have to be decided once we get there. So, so AI, is, is, it, is, it, is it really, can you really look at AI independently as a thing, or do you have to look at AI as it, as a mechanism for, for example, a uh, health span instead of lifespan, like your healthy lifespan and extending it 20 or 30 years or AI with uh, robots and, or AI with um, 
uh, say, uh, autonomous vehicles. Like, do you, do you, can you look at AI as its own entity or do you have to look at it in context of, of a specific uh, vertical that, that and, and how do you look at, at AI? So I think that's where this distinction between narrow and general is very important. While it's narrow, it's domain specific. Yes, this is your AI for healthcare. This is your drone AI. The moment you hit general intelligence, it's a human being, faster, smarter, you get free labor, physical, cognitive. So it impacts everything at once. And a lot of standard cultural and economic norms disappear. So if you have free labor, how does that impact the uh, value of a dollar? What does that mean even? Can you have property in a world where you can earn infinite amount of money without working? So questions like that, I don't have many answers because you cannot predict how that technology will impact us and what the technology will actually do. The moment AI itself starts doing research and development and engineering, we no longer able to predict what happens in five years, two years, one year. So, and so for the listeners that are there are listening in, so th there is the, this, th this thought pattern that AI will be so intelligent that we can actually outsource thinking about money-making or uh, coming up with new ideas or in innovation in an area because it can do computation at, at a scale well beyond the human brain or even four or five brains. And, and so that is that uh, is are, are you thinking that's going to be right at so AGI are we saying that that's going to be like in the year 2030 2040 2050 like where do you, I know there's a lot of opinions about this but where do you see AGI happening yeah nobody knows for sure it's very hard to predict especially the future but uh, historically a lot of timelines kind of converged around 2045 2045 okay. with recent significant investments, uh, companies like OpenAI, I think we expedited it where it could be much sooner, much closer. But again, nobody knows for sure. The important realization is that it doesn't matter. It's such a major change, whatever it happens in 10 years or 15 years, it makes no difference. It still completely changes the whole society. And all of it is based on our assumption that we can control it. That is not a given. My research is about how do we control something smarter than us? And if we don't succeed at that, asking, well, how is my stock portfolio going to do after super intelligence is a meaningless question. We don't know if we're gonna have society, if we don't know if we're gonna have economy. So we have bigger problems than uh, optimizing how to share profits. Yeah, that's, an, that's could actually could actually be the title of this program. How do we control something that's smarter than us? And technically it's smarter than us now. I mean, if we use our phone in some as aspects, it's very kind of narrow, but uh, there's parts of our phone where we ask questions and things like that and speak, it speaks back the answer. So um, it's also global us. It's not an individual. It's all of us as a scientific community, as a society. So it's really just a competing agent to all of us. So if something is, now I've heard some people say that we're going to create AI to police AI. Is that, is that a possibility where we'll actually create artificial AI algorithms that will essentially create uh, guardrails for, for AI in certain areas? So, cause we technically won't know if a AI comes, uh, basically uh, starts acting out of bounds. Uh, I mean, certainly in the military realm, we won't know that, but just in the civilian world, we won't, we won't know because there's no, it's not like we'll have a police force, but what will be the police force of the future? So that never made any sense to me. That's kind of catch-22. You need a safe AI to be a police officer to control bad AI. Well, how did you get to police AI first? That's a harder problem. You're making a more capable, stronger AI. Why don't you just make it right in the first place? You cannot have this uh, kind of recursive uh, loop where you need better and smarter AI to defend you against your dumber, more malevolent AIs. It doesn't well, seem to make sense. It makes sense with narrow AIs. You have uh, a system which may be trading stocks. You have another system making sure it's not, uh, I don't know, engaging in insider trading or something like that. So as long as you're below this level of generality, you can have narrow tools competing. Once you hit general,
Okay, so narrow, so narrow tools, just for everybody listening, so you're back to the original conversation. So narrow AI deployed in an industry that may help that industry, you can have guardrails around that stock trading, uh, maybe health. Um, we see it already with cybersecurity, for example, you have systems defending, you have systems looking for exploits. So, so it's a competition with narrow systems. Okay, right, right. And so, but that also, it also can be used um, and, and it is already being used, but it also can be used on the offensive uh, capabilities to uh, the, these tools, but that's very, it's in a narrow, it's in a narrow context is your point. So when you get to artificial ge general intelligence or as the, the picture to your above your left shoulder, the artificial super intelligence, really at that point, you are having, you're, you're, are you out of the narrow uh, lens at that point and you're having multiple um, essentially AI avatars in, in many sense, or how do you look at it at that, at, at that point? So that's also a great question. There is some disagreement in the community about what happens. Do you have multiple AGIs competing or do you have uh, convergence where all of them just become kind of like one super system because it's sharing cloud resources, it has all the same information. What does it mean for two AIs to be separate AIs? It's not obvious. So that could go both ways. It seems that if you are the first system to become that capable, you have an advantage. You can prevent other systems from emerging. So the first super intelligence to show up would probably be the one we'll have to live with for a long time. Interesting. So, so in many respects, it, it's, uh, it could be an arms race. I mean, it is. It's already an arms race. Different countries, US, China, Russia, trying to get there first. And, and we probably don't, we probably wouldn't know that this is happening. I mean, people in the, in the industry know maybe what's happening, but I wonder, I wonder if they're, I wonder if this is happening uh, consciously with, with our uh, military and defense uh, programs where we're actually trying, because it's, it's a very different, there's a military application, but then there's also just from a commercial standpoint, we can't, we can't test CRISPR the same way that the Chinese can test CRISPR with that, with, with, is that is that is that a, is that a problem for the U.S.? Uh, it depends on what you're optimizing for. If you want to get there first, then it's problematic. If you want to get there without experimenting on your own citizens, it may be an advantage. So it depends on how you see it. Well, I mean, it, it for me, it's uh, it, I don't spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about it. But if you can, if you can optimize mice and make better mice with CRISPR. Then ultimately, you should be able to optimize human beings, which is really the first time that we've depended on somebody other than God and serendipity to to craft the human or, or natural evolution to craft the human race. I guess now we're actually inserting our will into the creative process, which means we we're going to create almost like a separate human race or separate. Um, almost since Homo sapiens broke off from Africa, and there was and there was Neanderthals, and mm -hmm. and there was. Homo sapiens, it seems like we're back there again in many respects. That's definitely the case that in China, there are projects to understand what uh, genes are responsible for higher intelligence, right? To understand it at scale and maybe optimize it. If you have a population which is significantly smarter, it's a huge advantage. Oh, I would, see so. I would say so. So in your book that you have, The Artificial Intelligence Safety and Security, what, what, are, what are some of the the main main themes and that we talk about with security, like what would be from a general population versus just AI researchers getting together, you know, if you had to distill, what are some of the couple of the main themes you think the general population ought to be aware of for planning for the for the future? Because 2045 is not that far down the down the road. I mean, it's right around the corner. Right. So the difference between safety and security, what do we mean? Security is what we traditionally talk about in cybersecurity. You have external actors, hackers, they want to steal your code, influence decisions of your system, modify your data sets. Uh, with AI, you also have internal concerns. The system itself is an agent, it's capable, and you want to make sure it doesn't take any actions you perceive as negative for your business, for you personally. So that's the safety angle of it. You're controlling the system, 
and at the same time you are protecting it from external actors. Uh, this specific book is a collection of uh, about 30 chapters by different uh, people working in the area. Uh, they address concerns from legal point of view. Can you have artificial lawyers finding loopholes in our legal system? Economic point of view, philosophy, uh, really any subdomain has something to contribute to this very important discussion. What do we want to build? How do we control it? What is success going to look like? Because we don't even agree on what it is we're trying to accomplish with those systems. Do we want them to take over? Do we want to stay in control? If the system takes over, how does it decide what to do? So all those things are still kind of open to interpretation. What, what do you think is the best uh, path? Do you think that there's going to be, um, uh, and is there, is, 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 is our intelligence need to be more narrow as, as we go through, for example, teaching with students and teaching, um, so if we're gonna have, is it too simple to look at the advent of, of uh, we used to have ditch diggers. So in the early 1900s, we, if we needed to build a ditch, we would get a bunch of people, get a bunch of labor with a shovel and, and, and build the ditch, whether it's 100 feet or, or 100 miles. And then we invented steam shovels and then backhoes and dozers and things like that. It's still, it doesn't mean that we don't use ditch diggers still, but it's just, it's just not as prevalent. So you, people had to go find other ways of making a living. Is, is AI going to be that helper uh, steam shovel for us so that we're, our skills are going to up level and that we're going to be having broader thought on subjects, but then be able to deploy helpers to, to help us? Is, it, is that how, how you see it evolving? So I go back to this distinction between narrow and general, and it's a paradigm shift. While we have narrow systems, they are tools. They are helping us. They make us more productive. Uh, we can be more creative. That's all good. The moment it hits human level and quickly super intelligent level, you stop being competitive. You have nothing to contribute. A system will be better at whatever it is you are doing. So you can still kind of do it as a hobby, but uh, I don't think there is a broad commercial application to your skills, or if you talk about education, you can go to college for 20 years, you're still not as smart as that system, so it doesn't really matter. So you're saying that just the broad societal impact will just be uh, so substantial that we won't need to... So how we think about the human race changes uh, uh, fundamentally, because there's going to be something smarter than a human. Okay. Exactly. We are no longer the smartest animal around and we are probably not in control at that point. So it's more, what will this system or group of systems decide to do for well, us or to us? And do you, you don't think that there's a way that we've devised yet that we could, um, that put a, uh, put, guardrails around super intelligence? So my recent work is exactly that, trying to understand limits to what is possible, even in theory, much less in practice, just theoretical limits uh, to control. And there seems to be strong limits on explainability. How do those systems make decisions? Just understanding how the decision was made, predicting their behavior, uh, monitoring them, and uh, most important, control. No matter how you define control, and there are multiple things you can say, control meaning direct orders, control meaning you kind of, you know what I mean and you do what you think I want you to do, control in the sense I trust you fully, just decide what's best for me. Under all these different frameworks, there are still huge problems for us. And as far as I know today, no one has a working safety mechanism which would scale to any level of performance. I see. So basically, the, we we keep working for ways to to secure and and to put a um, uh, put it in a box, but but nobody's really truly figured out how to do this. Even with quant, but in but in truth, though, we don't know the capabilities with quantum computing. So maybe we're not asking the right questions yet. Well, I mean, if quantum computing came online prior to to super AGI. Maybe, maybe that. Maybe we're just not answering, asking the right questions yet because we don't have the, we, we we don't have the capabilities to to we don't have the computational models yet in place. 
I think more compute or better computers help develop more capable AI. It makes it faster, expedites learning. I don't see how it directly helps security or safety. Okay. My problem is not that I don't have enough compute. My problem is I have no idea how to control something smarter than me. So, so it seems to be kind of a disadvantage. So even if we got quantum computers, it's not obvious that we need them to get to super intelligence, but if we did, it would just speed up the arrival date. So in, in, the, in, the, in the context of, uh, I, I, a guy came by my house today and said, do you need firewood? And I needed him, he's come to our house for the past 10 years, every sporadically, he just drives from West Virginia and has a, a kind of a beat down truck, loads it up with wood and just shows up in the neighborhood and distributes it. So we needed him three weeks ago and I didn't have his card and he doesn't have a website. Like it's just, it's, but you know, there's just a business, you know, he's running a business. It's a wood, wood chops down the wood with his family and delivers it. And to me, that's an interesting, interesting challenge for, as a business person is, you know, what, what would be if he had the ability to stand up a website to have a customer list, to to be able to get his name out, and and uh, and had the ability to do that, that that seems to me to be a, an interesting capability for for uh, for for an intelligent system. Someone's got to deliver the firewood. Uh, you know, someone's got to put the skyscraper up. Someone's got to put the concrete on the ground. Now, um, I, I don't know the role of AI in that in that sense. But there's got to be some application where as we as, a, as smarter and smarter AI comes in, now we can just deliver the firewood and interact with another human. And I'm, and I'm wondering, as, as we're going down this path, if, if there's a combination for like how, how we're thinking about AI in that context. So are you asking about the physical aspect of it, like how robots will integrate with AI and actually participate in the physical world? Or yeah, yeah. How, how, the, how basically we can make something that's uh, essentially algorithms is software code and uh, it's deployed, how someone who's just moving firewood, as it, just as an example, it could be bricks, it could be um, putting a house up or it could be whatever, but how he would participate in this, in this world if, if we've really thought that through. Well, that's the problem. I don't see many solutions for it. Seems like a job which could be easily automated even with existing technology and there is great progress in robotics. Some manual labor physical jobs are more secure, like plumbers have it good because every house is unique. Pipes are weird. You have to climb places. So they'll probably be like the last set of people to be fully automated. But something like just delivering Wood randomly seems like it could be done with a self-driving car and unloading process. So uh, I don't see long-term future in that business. Uh, there could be, like today we have this niche market for handmade, like people make it manually. And so it's more luxury type item, you charge more. So maybe having a real human come to your house will be very elite and special. And that would be his thing. But in general, most people just want cheap firewood from Walmart. They'll click a button and it will show up by drone or whatever. And again, this is assuming we need to burn wood to get heat or energy, so yeah. Right, right, good point. Yeah, because there's, there's even questions about that. Well, it, it's just interesting. That was just a, a case that I'm in, a, in as, as everybody's listening, you know, this is, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about just the autonomy of just long haul truckers, you know, moving moving trucks across the United States. And again, in your definition, that's a narrow application of AI. That's not um, super sentient AI that's thinking on a on a um, on a global basis. But basically, you you don't think AI from a from an artificial general intelligence is there's 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 argument about whether that's one big global brain or whether that is something that, that actually is fenced off by country or, or, or they maybe these AIs have decided themselves how to break off if, there's that, if they're that intelligent. So, so there's, there's no uh, general consensus, is there at this point, Roman? There is not. And if we are not in control, then obviously we are not breaking it up. We are not deciding any country borders. We can't even do it for people and jurisdictions, much less for networks or, 
think of something distributed like a Bitcoin network. It's not unique to any jurisdiction, any geography. It is already fully global. So if those uh, smart contracts, those autonomous corporations keep getting smarter, we already have the situation where there is one Bitcoin and that dominates. Yeah, there are other cryptocurrencies, but it dominates the market. And the first mover advantage is enough to maintain that uh, advantage through network effects or through some other means, uh, in this case, through superior intelligence, access to resources. Uh, if you first have a market, let's say stock market, you can take advantage of opportunities which will not be there for second, third system using similar approach. So does your research at all look at the impact of, of uh, blockchain and, and adjacent technologies that AI is supporting? Or are you just looking more at the, the larger picture of, of AI as a, as a general category? Not particularly. We kind of looked at it as a way to track data, make sure that uh, the data is authentic. Uh, no one messes with it. There's a problem with deep fakes. And so this allows us to keep track of who created this data at what time using what sensors. Uh, there is also opportunities for uncensored communication using blockchain protocol, but uh, not particularly for AI safety, no. So what, what kind of questions are you finding most frequently asked of you now in the AI safety world? What are, what are some of the, the big ones that, that, you keep, that keep coming back to you um, repeatedly that people ask? It really depends on uh, who you're talking to. So if it's people completely outside of this domain, their concerns are kind of like science fiction. Is three laws of robotics sufficient? Why are we even working on it? You know, Asimov had it years ago. If it's a little more advanced crowd, they may be asking about, as I said, consciousness and how is computer going to kill me if it doesn't feel anything? things of that nature. So it really depends on where you at. And even with um, kind of advanced uh, researchers publishing in this area, I feel like they underappreciate the impact from this. So you see papers like, well, after we get super intelligence, how do we share profits from this amazing invention? Like how are we gonna split it? Who gets more money? And it feels like uh, they may be missing something from it. So, so, uh, how, so, how people are making money from this, and you know, there's definitely there's definitely uh, an interesting thing I think that has to be figured out, and that's and that's how you have people that aren't familiar with these technologies are are, are they truly going to be left behind? And I'm not I don't mean that just because I feel bad for the folks. That's not where I'm coming from. It's just that there's been a general, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking into VR capabilities for my company right now. And then my, the guy that, you know, has four kids that he's thrown in the back of a pickup truck from West Virginia to deliver food, I'm mean, sorry, deliver uh, uh, wood to my door. And, and so, you know, he's running a business. He's been running it for 15 years. Clearly he makes enough from it to sustain five kids, but now I'm putting together VR rooms for uh, collapsing capability of people being able to integrate uh, work, both in my employees, my board of directors, future customers. And it's just, a, it's an interesting um, shift because you just have vast, vast chunks of, of people that, that are um, really not as, as technology oriented. And, and then, so, you know, where, where, I just look at that as a very interesting, kind of a, it's a complicated problem to solve for, if it isn't even a problem to begin with. It is very interesting to see this difference on the same planet. At the same time, we have people who are in the jungle chasing animals with spears and people trying to get to Mars all at the same time. We argue about how to control super intelligence, but there is nothing more advanced than a diaper, which I have to change. So there is a lot of this uh, craziness going on. I'm not sure if we ever get to a point where it's uh, same level for everyone. VR does offer amazing opportunities for kind of equalizing some things and for AI safety. One of the biggest problems in safety research is the alignment problem. How do we get not just computers to do what we want, but all 8 billion of us to agree on what we want? And given that two of us will never agree on anything, probably, uh, it's unsolvable. 
unless you're doing it virtually. In virtual reality, if it's good enough to where it looks real, it feels real, I can give everyone what they want. I can have 8 billion universes and you get yeah. exactly what you want. I don't have to compromise. So, so far, that's the only solution I found to actually solving this multiple agent alignment problem. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I, would, I would agree with you with that. I, I was in a conference last week or two, two weeks ago and the last day of the conference was in an Oculus uh, headset and the second day of the conference was on a virtual spatial web, which was, I, I would call like a transition um, between full headset, but that headset's going away. Like the Apple shipped, shipping the glasses in a, in a month um, where you're gonna be able to interact with the, with, a, with essentially the, um, uh, the internet and uh, 3D objects. And now we're looking at NFTs and blockchain. And, and, and this is a really interesting capabilities that normal humans can buy a pair of glasses and, inter and now with uh, SpaceX uh, and Elon's company, SpaceX, putting satellites around the planet, we're going to be able to get the next 3 billion people online. And so uh, you look at this from a world of abundance point of view. I think AI potentially could be very beneficial um, in the sense that we have so many connected humans and so many connected things that it's, you can't manage that as a human. And the question is, uh, you know, is the AI here purposely to help us? And that's a question like, what do you mean help us, Bill? How, AI doesn't help us. We, we're the ones who program it. But then you're just saying, no, there'll be a point in which it's programming us. <laughs> it's controlling us for sure. We're starting to see glimpses of it with big social media companies, Facebook, Twitter. They have algorithms which go in and say, you are not allowed to post that. And a lot of times they make a mistake. It has nothing to do with the topic. Uh, I think there are some great examples. I collect uh, AI accidents, AI failures. And I think the recent one I saw was uh, some sort of uh, chess YouTube channel got banned for using yeah. black and white. So, yeah, I mean, I've, some of the political channels that I've listened to have been deplatformed. Um, and, and we think that our human beings are making that decision, which a human being had to put a global um, identifier into the algorithm. But the fact of the matter is, there's too many of these sites for Facebook and YouTube to be chasing them down. It's got to be a helper AI in the background, correct? Uh, right. Uh, at least the first step of filtering is based on AI, looking for keywords, looking for patterns. So there is a lot of uh, false flags and you report it and they reverse it a few days later. But this kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. They're shaping your views. They're shaping what you do get access to, who you can be friends with. So it's it's very predictive for what's to come. You know, it really, it really is. And, um, and, and so if, if, if anybody, well, where do you go to research uh, what, well, that's not the right question because you're the guy that would be the researching it. Um, but I'm curious about how it, these changes are happening so fast and maybe they're not happening fast. Maybe they've been happening for five years, but the influence of a human being just by this, by this phone and what pops on the screen and what gets forced down to you is a form of propaganda. I mean, that's kind of old uh, Germany. You know, th this is this is uh, we've almost come out of the. I'm saying Germany. It could be Russia and China. The, whatever the propaganda, uh, 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 Afghanistan, Venezuela. It does in the U.S. Like it used to come from government. The government could influence the the population, but now that influence happens through technology, through a technology companies. And that's a really interesting problem to solve for. It is, and I was thinking about it. First Amendment protects you from what was at the time most powerful entities, governments. Today, multinational corporations are the most powerful entities. Something like Facebook is more powerful than a local government. So maybe we need to update our legal paperwork to make it compatible with uh, current situation, because otherwise, on paper, you still have those liberties, but in reality, you no longer have any options. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I, I think the, it's an interesting point. First Amendment was a government protection learned by kings and from the experience of kings and queens and, and uh, the abuses of power from these structures from the, the, uh, through the, throughout, throughout time. And then we decided to come up with a different, different approach. But uh, now we need another approach. 
now we need to come up with another approach. So it's evolving. Very... There is an interesting chapter in this book. I keep uh, pushing the book, but so one thing is censorship and limiting what you are exposed to. The other one comes then we see those AI systems generate content. You saw language models like GPT-3 from OpenAI. They can write text, which most people think it's written by another human. It's that high in quality. So you can be drowned in the ocean of fake news, propaganda, fake stories. Friends online, you have maybe chatbots. You don't even know if you are connected to a real world. You can be living in a completely artificial created bubble of those uh, bots, chatbots, language models. And it's uh, going beyond text. We now can do images, video, sound. So that's what I was trying to remember. GPT-3, you just mentioned it. That was, that's the, 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 the That's been the, a little while ago. It goes so quickly. Now it's no longer okay. the latest or the best. So you, you have to watch. They, they did it for images now. Yes, yes, They're yes. doing it uh, for other domains as well. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting that influence, and so you know, and it's it's funny. We were talking about the the AI would have its essentially its own brain to dominate once it gets smart enough. Now it's it's essentially people, it's tech companies or people, or um, that influence can be wielded just by the fact that they they own um, the the gateway of, the, of of pushing down content down to down to a uh, so. It's it's uh, it's really powerful. This is really um, a really important conversation we're having. Well, I, I appreciate you for the conversation today, Roman. I, I know it's been a couple of years since we talked, and I encourage everybody to get uh, artificial intelligence, safety, and security. That's that's listening to this. This is a these are powerful uh, conversations about the future. And uh, even though our our kids are being uh, taught. Uh, very specifically, how to how to build these these algorithms, and then ultimately how this is going to going to to morph into um, super intelligence. Uh, I think these are the, these are thinking patterns um, that we need to be thinking of for the future. I agree. Let's so I think the wisdom. There's a difference between wisdom and smarts, Roman. Uh, probably, but I'm sure there's artificial wisdom, just like artificial intelligence. I hadn't really thought of that, artificial wisdom. What do you mean by that? Well, if you can define what wisdom is and what it means to humans and how do we acquire it and measure it, I'm sure I can automate that process. I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't thought about, there's a difference between understanding these powerful technologies and then deploying them in a, in a wise manner. Or not guess, deploying them, that could not, be your wisdom. <laughs> or not deploying them. And, and largely, uh, the culture in which you live can influence how you deploy things. Uh, absolutely. And expectations from technology are very different as well. This is wonderful, Roman. Is there anything I, uh, you wanted to clarify but th or anything that you wish I had asked um, that you want to have a chance to, to say before we go? No, I think you got all the right questions. Uh, it was fun. Thank you, Roman. Thank you for jumping on this call. It's been a couple of years, but I, I appreciate you getting us caught up on your book and your research. And, and this was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Thank you, sir.